Yeah, so you can all see my screen now. And I can see you too. I just need to make my window bigger. And hmm, my chat uh, disappeared. Hang on a second. Let me find the chat. Where is, there it is. Just in case anybody has a question. Okay, so I have two screens. So I can see my slides, I can see the chat, and I can see all of you. Apa kabar. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about um, online and multimedia news packaging. And I know you might be saying, what is that anyway? So we'll talk about that first. Uh, see, here we go. So, uh, when we say online and multimedia news, right, we do not mean only websites, right? Online and multimedia news is mobile apps and social media and podcasts and short videos that the same video might be on YouTube or somebody might put it on Facebook or they might put it you know, in any other platform that they want to share their short video. So all these things are, uh, they can be news and they are online and multimedia, right? So basically all the digital things, right? So not printed newspapers and not TV news, uh, but all the things that you can see on a digital device. Uh, so then this other word in the name of uh, the class today is packaging, right? And I think you probably know what is a package, right? You get a package maybe in the mail, maybe you wrap a package and give to somebody, something like that. So when we say a package of news, right, it's, it's one story, um, but it might have different uh, pieces that are different media types, right? So that's what we mean by a package. And it doesn't mean that every story has to be a big package, right? Some stories are just small and they're just going to be some text and maybe nothing else or maybe one photo and that's all, right? Um, so a small story doesn't need a big package, but some stories are complicated and they have a sort of many different aspects and so sometimes we want to uh to tell the story completely we might have different parts uh different mm, different types of media telling different parts of the story so um the way that the journalist packages the story uh, will depend on what kind of story it is. And also, like, how much time do the journalists have, right? If they have to go quick, quick, then they can't make a big package. But sometimes the story is going on and on and on. Like, for example, the pandemic, right? It keeps going and going and going. So you can, you know, make a lot of big packages about the global pandemic crisis, right? Uh, so I'm going to show you just one package and it doesn't have a lot of fancy graphics and everything, but it's kind of an unusual story. Um, and what happened was uh, recently um, in, in the summer, uh, a big condominium fell down and you might have seen the news in Indonesia, right? So like a big apartment building, but it was a condo. And so 12 floors and it just, something happened, you know, the concrete was bad and it fell and 98 people died because they were at home, right? And their building fell down. So um, <laughs> the, the tragedy, uh, hang on a second. Um, it's, oops, sorry. It's called, uh, the, the area where the condo building is, it's called surf side, you know, like beside the surf. So it's uh, the whole tragedy, the event is called the surf side 
power collapse. And that's in the headline of the story. Um, so the reason that I'm using this as an example is this was after, this was in September and the building fell down and but just like when you have a landslide or any kind of disaster, it takes a long time to find all the people who died and to identify them, right? So weeks go by and weeks go by and people are missing and then they're found. So it's kind of a, a long process. So when everybody was found and everybody who died was known, then the newspaper in Miami made this package. And this package is not about why did the building fall down? There's nothing in this package about the collapse of the building. This package is only about the people who died. So it's kind of a, a memory of those people, but also it's a way to tell their stories and to kind of humanize the, the tragedy of the building falling, right? So the journalists write a story about every one of the 98 people. So they have to find their story. They have to talk to their family. They have to get their pictures. And how do you organize 98 stories, right? It's a lot. And nobody's really going to read every story, but many people will read one or two or three stories, right? They're curious about who lived in the place and what happened to them. So the way they organized this package is they made a floor plan of the building. And as you scroll through the web page, the floor plan changes. So you start on the second floor and then you go to, um, gosh, I forget the word for floor. I used to know that, but you know, you start with Dua, then you go Tiga, then you go, you go, then I forget the word for four, but anyway, you go floor by floor by floor and you're showing each apartment, right? So the slide you're looking at right now is showing you the seventh floor, and it's showing you apartment number 702. And the three people, they are the people who lived in that apartment. And when the building fell down, they were in their home. And so they died. And the next screen I'll show you. So, uh, so you've got uh, a little graphic that shows which floor, number seven, and the apartment is blue. And then in this small paragraph is a link to each person, and that goes to another page. And if you want to read their big story, you can go and read a big story about each person. So the next one shows you this is a different apartment, a different floor, right? So I'm going to go back one. This is where we were, 7 and 702. Now we move to the 10th floor and we are in apartment uh, 10, 10, 10. All these people were in that apartment and these are other people who also died. Now, I know it's a very sad, it's a very sad story, but, you know, sometimes in journalism, we, we need to tell these sad stories. So this idea of how do you organize a very big amount of story, right? Really 98 small stories about 98 people. And what they did here was they organized it by the shape of the building. Now, this is not something you would do for a lot of stories. It just is perfect for this one story. And so it's one of those, uh, it's an example of I want to package this amount of reporting. What's a good way to make a package that fits this story? Um, the story also works fine on the phone. The only thing that is missing is the little floor plan, but you can still see 
which floor is their apartment on. And so you see the seven and you see the 10 and you can still read everything and follow the links, right? So they designed the package to be fine on mobile and also on a bigger screen. So I like this package because it's a lot, but we don't expect anybody to read everything, right? So we're not ordering it with the most important person at the top. The people are just in order of their apartments in the building. And the audience can pick and choose whatever they want. It's very easy to navigate because all you do in the story is you scroll up and down. Hey, did, um, did Dondi give the students um, the link to this slot, to these slides? Uh, oh, not yet. Not yet. Oh, let me wait. Let me put it in the chat so you can see it, because um, you, there's a link to the package and you could actually open it yourself. Hang on. Let me get the link. There we go. OK, I'm going to paste it into the chat. There we go. There. And also, if there's something you don't understand and you want to throw it into Google Translate, then now you have the slides for yourself. Uh, open the chat and you'll see the link. OK, um, so let me go back into present mode. There we are. OK, so it's a uh, oops, sorry. It's um, it's a it's a it's a good structure for the package because it's not complicated and because it's not complicated it's easy for anybody to find their way around and not get lost and they can look at what they want to see and then they're finished right it's not too much so that a person opens it up and says oh it's too much i'm just gonna uh, bookmark it and then they never come back right so these are the kinds of things you think about when you're packaging the story, okay? I like the floor plan because for me, it gave me a feeling almost like I understood what their building was like. And it gave me even more sympathy for the people who were in the building when it fell down. So I felt like it was a very effective package. Um, what we can learn from this is the way that it tells the story of every person. It engages the reader with this interactive floor plan. Um, it's easy for people to explore it any way they want because nothing is hidden and nothing is complicated. And it doesn't make the reader feel like they have to look at everything. They can just look at whatever amount they want to look at. So I think a big tip in for a large story is, you know, don't make people feel overwhelmed. I think sometimes when journalists make a website about a big story, they put too many things on the first page. And, and when the audience comes, regular people come to that page, they say, I, you know, it, it's too much. I don't have time for this. I'll look later. And then maybe there's never later, right? So don't make it too complicated for people. Um, and this is just a, a close up so that you can see how, um, you know, it's showing this is different apartments on the fourth floor, right? So whichever uh, group of people you're looking at, it shows which apartment did they live in. Um, let's see. Now, if you wanted to tell a story about these people in a completely different media type, like a podcast, you would have to choose a really different way to tell it, right? If it was a podcast, either you would have to have many, many episodes about like, you know, about the different people, or if it was just one episode, you would have to leave a lot of people out right? You couldn't fit them all into like one hour or 30 minutes, right? Um, another thing to think about with this package is you can't make this package the day after the building fell down. 
you, you don't have all this information at that time, right? So, you know, whenever there is any kind of disaster, um, you know, a big a train wreck, an earthquake, the volcano erupts, right? You don't have all the information on the first day or even the second day. But this is the kind of story you can tell one month later or two months later because people are still interested. You know, people in the public are saying, what happened to all the people at the Surfside Tower? You know, who died, who lived? People are still curious, right? But before you make something that took all this work, you know, there was a lot of reporting, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails trying to get the stories of all the people. You have to judge how much interest is there in this story, right? If everybody in your community already forgot about it, if something else is happening and nobody cares anymore, then, then you don't make this story. But this is something where people are still asking questions. People are still concerned. Um, a lot of the people in the building came from other countries because Miami is the kind of city where people come from all over the world. So the interest was there and this newspaper made this package. So that is the longest example I'm going to show you. I thought I'd show you right away while, you know, you're still fresh. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about like how is digital journalism different from like old journalism, like your grandparents' journalism, right? Uh, you know, how have things changed? Because your whole life, probably, uh, I don't know, I don't see the SDUA students, but most of you are so young that the internet was always here in your life, right? But your grandparents did not have all this digital everything, right? So <coughs> we have this environment now of digital news and three things came together to create this environment, right? One is that every kind of media is a computer file, right? So we can copy them, any number of times, we can send them anywhere, we can play them on many devices. So, you know, audio, video, text, everything is a digital file. It's not something you hold in your hand, right? Um, the second thing is that we have so many different digital devices. We have smartphones, we have tablets, laptops, you know, uh, uh, smart TVs and so forth, right? So that's where we play the media. We have many different devices that we can carry around and so forth. Then the third factor is, of course, the internet. The internet connects everything and allows us to share the files, send files to each other, make copies of the files and so forth, right? So in this kind of environment, every person has tons of choices, right? They can get all kinds of information, news, entertainment, whenever they want. That's not how it used to be, right? So I couldn't find a photo of Indonesian grandparents, but this would be like, you know, my grandparents back in the old days, right? Um, you know, when they got a TV, it was a big thing. But if they wanted to see news on TV, they had to turn on the TV at one time of the day, right? And the rest of the time, it was entertainment, right? So you had to say, oh, it's time for the news on your analog watch, right? We turn on the TV now so we can see the news. Um, or if you wanted to have, uh, you know, text stories and media, you would have to buy the newspaper, or borrow the newspaper from your friend, right? Now, I know you know this, you know, you know this, but it's so different from your life, right? Because you couldn't just, when you were bored, you didn't have a phone to look at. You just had to be bored and stand around and stare at the sky, right? <laughs> so um, it was quite different. So now everybody can access any information whenever they want, right? And they can share information, whether it's true or not. They can uh, find information, they can find answers to their questions, and then they can send it to their friends and their family. Um, they can look at this stuff, whether they're at work or at home, or they're on the bus, right? 
And this is, you know, the environment we live in now, right? So the reason that I want to, you know, start with this, because I know this is the world you live in, so it's not surprising to you. But what it means, and what I think a journalism student sometimes forgets, it means that your journalism is competing with everything, right? Because it's not like, you know, oh, it's eight o'clock. I have to turn on the TV to see the news or else I'll miss it. People can see the news whenever they want. And also they can see 10,000 other things, right? So they have so much choice that journalism is sometimes the least important thing that they want to look at today. And we have to keep this in mind. You have to keep this in mind because you don't want to create journalism that nobody pays attention to, right? So you have to think of this idea of you're competing with all this fun stuff, all these videos and games, movies, and, you know, just, uh, you know, TikTok, you know, stuff that's just really funny and fun. And it's right there on the same device. So your journalism has to be interesting and good in order to get to people. Also, the people in the audience, the people who didn't go to university for journalism, they don't have any training. Well, they have the same tools that the journalist has. So, you know, in the old days, your grandparents didn't have a printing press and they didn't have a TV studio, so they couldn't make news for other people. But today, anybody can like make news or make journalism. It might not be good, it might not be accurate, but they can make some kind of news or story and they can share it using the exact same tools that the journalist is using, right? And this reality that we all live in, it changes the relationship between the people and the journalists. And I want to emphasize this because I think when students are studying journalism, and in the United States as well, right? In the US, in Indonesia, anywhere. When students are studying journalism and they're dreaming about becoming a journalist, they're, they're kind of imagining this perfect world where um, they're going to, you know, find these stories and make this journalism and the world is going to care that you made this and you shared this news with them. But in reality, people want to tell you things too, right? They want to share things with the journalists. They want the journalists to pay attention to the issues that are important to them. And if the journalists aren't giving the public what the public wants most, the public will just go somewhere else, right? So this is a reality to keep in your mind that, you know, there's like the beautiful ideal of journalism and how important it is for the democracy and for the nation. And yet the nation is made of people and those people are playing video games and listening to music and stuff like that, right? So you have to think about, you know, what is real and what is the ideal? So that two-way arrow in the middle, right? The arrow is going both ways, right? So this is not like your grandparents when the TV news was like coming from some important place like in Jakarta and it was coming to them like, oh, you little people, here comes the news, right? And the newspaper, oh, you know, here's the newspaper. I'm going to pick it up. It's so important. I'm going to read everything and then I'll be informed. And, you know, like this is my only way to get the news. It's just not like that anymore, right? And the people are pushing back at the journalists and saying, why are you always, you know, talking about this? We think you should talk about this other thing. So old style journalism was that the news organization decided what was important. 
they decided what was important and the people didn't have really any voice in that, right? Um, and what did the newspaper and the TV news tell us about? They told us about the rich people and the big businesses and the government, right? The politicians, the, the pe people with power, right? Those were the stories that were told in the news, right? And the news was a business. It makes money. The people with money are, you know, connected with the other people with money. And it was just a closed system. Now, that system still exists. You still have newspapers that are big business. You still have TV stations that are big business, right? Broadcast media, um, all those things run by wealthy people. They're connected to the politicians in the government. In my country, in your country, it's the same, right? But there's this newer stuff, right? Um, journalism is done in a lot of other ways. Journalism is not limited to newspapers and TV. And the people who commit acts of journalism, right? They are not a journalist, but they can make something one day that's journalism. Maybe they only do it one time in their life, but somebody can make some kind of journalism with no training or anything because they were in the right place at the right time. They had their phone and they picked up their phone and they turned on their video camera, right? So people who are outside of journalism, might one day, any day, they might be making journalism and everybody will see it. So now I'm going to talk about these six things in order. Okay, so I start with a list and then there will be at least one slide for each one, right? So this idea that I mentioned already, journalism is not limited to the products of a company that makes journalism or a business, right? Journalism exists in many other places now. And the people who do journalism or make journalism, they're not all journalists. Right? So let that sink in, right? Because I know you're studying to be a journalist, right? Um, and some probably have you know, very uh, passionate dreams about what you will do to help people or whatever when you are a journalist. Um, but other people are just going to accidentally be a journalist for one day or one week because something happens to them. So let's talk about the six things. Okay. Now, public journalism is sometimes called civic journalism, and they're the same thing, right? And this is an idea, right? It's not a business or anything. It's just an idea that says, well, the thing at the center of journalism ought to be what the citizens care about, right? Um, the, the central idea of journalism should be all about the public or the people, right? But that's the opposite of big business, right? Uh, it's the opposite of the politicians and the Orankaya who are in the center of the news that's published by the newspaper or the TV station, right? So this ideal of public journalism, <coughs> excuse me, it means uh, that journalists would go out and find out what issues are most important to the people, the public, the regular people, right? Like parents and with kids in school and people who have a little shop and uh, you know, somebody who drives a taxi and just like regular normal people find out what do they care about? They care about jobs. They care about health care. They care about education for their children. But like, you know, talk about what kind of obstacles are they facing or what do they wish would change in their life? Or, you know, um, maybe, you know, they're trying to buy a house, but they can't get the money together and they're trying to figure out what can I do? I don't want to rent anymore. So these kinds of issues that are very, very important to most people in the society, right? That is what public journalism says should be 
the core of journalism. So this is not a reality. This is like an ideal or a not a dream because, you know, sometimes the journalist can do this kind of journalism, right? Um, some journalists are committed to doing this kind of journalism all the time. But, you know, if you're working for a boss who is, you know, the, the owner of the newspaper, well, you know, you have to do what your job tells you to do. So next thing, right? Oh, this, sorry, there's an example. Um, so do you know this online publication called Manga Bay? I see some nodding. Good. It's a great, oh, it's really great. And this is one example of public journalism or public centered journalism, right? It talks about some Papuan people, Papua people, who live in a small village, right? I remember it's called a desa, right? So they're Orang Desa in Papua, and they got the palm oil company to go away. So great. They didn't get their whole forest cut down by the big company, right? But they are still struggling. They're still working. Um, to get the government to acknowledge that these village people actually own that forest. I mean, they live by this forest for many, many generations, right? Who owns that forest if not them? And that's their claim. They say, this is our forest. You know, we lived here before there was even Indonesia. Right. Before Indonesia was even a country, our grandparents and our great grandparents are living here. So this is this is our land. We own it. And right now their struggle is to get the government to say, yes, that is correct. So far, it's not happening. Right. But that's what this one story is about. So this is an example of public journalism, because who is it about? It's about these people in a small village. It's about the thing that matters most to those people in that village. And it's really far away from Bandung, right? I mean, you know, probably I've never been to Papua. Probably most of you have never been there, right? But it's part of your country. And so, you know, we tell these stories because it's all one country, right? And so this way people in Bandung can find out about people in Papua and the fact that, you know, they are saying we should own our land so that we can protect it. So it's an example of public journalism. Now, let's see, did I, there we go. Okay, now another concept about journalism is advocacy journalism. This is a new, this is different, right? So um, you might not know the word advocate. An advocate is a person who supports a particular cause or a policy. Now, it doesn't mean they're an activist, they might be, but advocate is kind of a, a milder word, right? It's just they just they support in it and they really believe in it deeply, right? And this goes against the idea of journalism being neutral or being objective, right? So some journalists say, we shouldn't be objective. Some of these issues are too important and we should take a side. We should say, I stand for this. I am on this side. And they shouldn't hide it. They shouldn't pretend they're showing all the sides, right? Now, um, some journalists think that. Um, not all journalists think that, right? This is just like a, a, a part of what exists out there in the world of journalism. Um, another thing to understand about advocacy journalism is... It's not opinion journalism. It's not opinion. It's well-researched, well-reported, truthful journalism, but it's on a particular side. So a lot of advocacy journalism is done by NGOs. So this is another idea like you, I know you all know about NGOs, You've heard of Amnesty International. You've heard of Greenpeace, right? But did you know that they actually do journalism? 
And some people, especially some old journalists, would tell you, no, 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 no. What they do is public relations. But I disagree. And I'm not the only one. Okay. So advocacy journalism is well reported, honest, truthful, not hiding anything, but it's on a particular side. Right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna give um, you know, a lot of attention to the opposition. It's going to say, you know, like it's going to, if it saved the whales, it's going to be like, the whales are important. Here's why they're important. Here are the bad things that happen to whales. You know, this is everything we know about whales who are being, you know, killed by fishermen. And, and they're not going to say, oh, yeah, and some people like to eat whales. They're not going to, you know, talk about that's nice for those people. They're just going to leave that out, right? Because their point is, you know, about saving whales. So that would be advocacy journalism. And I have an example. This is an example of a very journalistic story published by Human Rights Watch. Aha, Perlina uh, published that there will be an advocacy journalism class. So this one example that I'm giving you, it's from the Philippines and it's a little older. It's from 2017, but it is, it's a long story. And if you look at it, even if you just scan the first few paragraphs, it is so journalistic, right? Like when I read this, I say, this is not public relations. This is not propaganda. This is factually reported journalism. And they got documents, um, you know, from the government, they uncovered things that the Philippine government had hidden about, you know, they were, the Duterte was, you know, is running around murdering people and saying it's part of his drug war. That's what this story is about. And the whole thing was reported by people, journalists who were paid by Human Rights Watch to do their journalism. So it's an example of advocacy journalism. Okay, now this is the third kind, right? We had a list of six and now this is the third kind. So, part and there's overlap between these, right? Sometimes there's some overlap, sometimes not, but participatory journalism, right? This is about participation and who's participating, the public, right? So this is an idea where you look at members of the public as collaborators with journalists, right? And so one example is, and this happens all the time, the public contributes photos and video when there's like a severe weather event, like a flood, or when there's a disaster, like a volcano erupts, right? The public, it, you know, and they're not necessarily sending it privately to the newspaper. No, they're, they're sharing these things on social media. But when somebody um, at a newspaper, a magazine, a news website, when they see somebody is sending these photos of like, you know, Gunung Merapi is erupting and then the same person is sending amazing photos, what can you do? You can reach out to that person on the same platform and you can say, can we buy your photos? Can we have permission to publish your photos on our website? Right? Because you can see that they are they are sharing really great photos, right? So another aspect of participatory journalism is that the journalists do their they use their training. They edit, they select, they verify, they make sure that this is, you know, like these photographs are from the volcano right now and not the volcano three years ago, right? So the journalists are doing their trained jobs, but they're working together hand in hand with members of the public who don't have any training. So people, it might not only be pictures, it might be people are, uh, you know, giving eyewitness reports, maybe they are writing what they see, maybe they're making an audio recording, you know, maybe they're on TikTok and they're talking, talking, talking about what they're seeing wherever they are, right? And 
most of the time in participatory journalism, the people in the public, they're not getting any pay for this. They could. I gave the example that maybe you would you'd tweet back at somebody or you'd you know, Facebook message them or whatever and say, we love your photos. Can we buy them? But sometimes the journalists just say, may we use them? Would you just give us permission, right? And, you know, it just depends. Maybe the person from the public, maybe they'll say, give me money. I mean, but maybe they won't. Depends. Uh, let's see. So um, I have this example I thought hard about because this is hard to explain. Um, and I don't know if I have the right word there. Um, John Carrick? Is that the bug that's in the picture, basically? Maybe? Sort of? Similar? Not? Anyway, the, the bug that we have here in North America is called cicada. That's what we call it, okay? And it looks like this bug in the picture. So they are sleeping underground for 17 years. And then they come out. And there's millions. And they make a lot of noise. So when it's time for them to wake up and come out, it's, oh, it's always a big news story. Right? So I remember, you know, when this happens, you know, a number of years ago, and then it happened again recently. And so this example of participatory journalism was that a radio news station in New York, they got together with some scientists and they said, can we involve the audience and ask them to help us predict when the cicadas will come out of the ground. And the way you do this is you measure the temperature down under the ground about, um, uh, I'm not sure how many centimeters, like maybe 20 centimeters down. So not really deep, right? Um, but you measure the temperature and when the temperature reaches, I wrote the centigrade, 18 degrees um, Celsius, right? Uh, that's when the bugs are going to come out and make all the noise. So the participatory journalism was on this radio station. They said on the radio, like every day, they said, go to our website and we have information for you, the public, about how to help us report about these bugs and when they're coming and when they're going to come. And when they do come and you could fill in a form, you could take pictures, but also you could build a temperature device and put it in the ground and help the journalists report. And this was for a very big area of the United States, like hundreds of miles, right? But it was all organized by this news radio station in New York. So it was kind of weird and kind of crazy, but a lot of people participated because they thought it would be fun or interesting. And school teachers got their school classes together and said, let's build this device and we will help the people on the radio and we will learn about the bugs. And so it became a big project. You know, it spread around and people had fun with it, right? They didn't ask to be paid because they enjoyed. So it's that's why I like it. It's like kind of a crazy example, but also um, the response was very positive. The public thought it was really a good time to learn about these bugs. So now another one of these terms, right? Um, now this is really an old term. And this is why I took a picture of this book because I thought, I have that book somewhere. Isn't that book really old? And I was at my office at uh, on the campus and I looked on my bookshelf and yes, there was that book. So if you see in the picture, it says grassroots journalism by the people for the people. That's the subtitle of this book, right? So this term grassroots journalism, usually people just say citizen journalism. But I wanted to talk about this term for a, a 
a little bit because I think in languages other than English, this word grassroots doesn't always make sense, right? People in other countries, even in, you know, in Europe, people say, what is this? Grassroots, what do you mean by that? So I wrote it down, right? It refers to the base or the source. So the roots of the grass, right? They are at the bottom of the grass under the ground. And that's where everything for the grass comes from, right? So when you say grassroots journalism, it's another way of saying it's coming up from the public. It's coming up from people who are just regular people. They're not doing their job. They're just, you know, uh, for some reason, they had to make journalism about something because either because it mattered to them very much or maybe just because they were in the wrong place at the right time or something like that, right? So we use this word grassroots um, when we say a grassroots social movement. We mean a social movement that just came from the people, not from a political party, not from any special interest, but the people just like grew up from their roots and they said, you know, we need to do this thing, right? So the next example is, is a very um, emotional example for Americans. And this is the case of George Floyd. And I think maybe even in Indonesia, you heard the name George Floyd. He's the man who died because a police officer put his knee, his leg, on George Floyd's neck. And he sat on George Floyd's neck until George Floyd was dead. And he was a police officer in uniform. And there were other police officers. And it is, you know, a terrible, terrible story. And it's not rare, right? But just like I think most countries, when the police officer does a terrible thing, usually he gets away with it. You know, the other police officers protect him and nothing bad happens to him. Well, this was different. And why was it different? You see the girl in the picture? She was 17 years old. She was taking her little nine year old cousin to get some candy at the store. And while she, this girl, Darnella, she's standing on the sidewalk while her little cousin is in the store, this terrible thing with George Floyd begins to happen right in front of her. And what you see in the picture is what she did. She held up her phone and she stood there for the whole thing, the whole thing. And just recently, like two weeks ago, this police, or no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. I have the date right there, June. In June, this police officer was sentenced to 22 years in prison because of her video. So when we say grassroots journalism or citizen journalism, I want you to think about Darnella who was 17. And I think she was scared, you know, because the police officers, there were, there were like five of them there. They said, put your phone down, put that phone down. Right. And she stood there. She was really brave. So I have the question there, is this journalism? Right. And, you know, we could argue about it. We could argue for a very long time. And some people can say yes. And some people can say no. But I think in that moment, what is she doing? I think she is doing journalism. It doesn't make her a journalist, right? It doesn't mean suddenly she's a journalist. But she was given a special citation as a Pulitzer Prize, which is one of the biggest prizes in journalism. Because what she did actually made a very big difference, right? The fact that she recorded something that was real and it was evidence, it was evidence to the trial, it was evidence for police reform, it was evidence that protesters talked about all summer long, right? So 
um, it was it was pretty important. And you know, when she started walking to the candy store, she never knew this was going to happen to her. So when we say grassroots journalism, it just comes up, just comes up out of the people. This is one example of what that means. So yet another, a whole different thing, okay? Um, solutions journalism. Now this, what this is, it's right there in the name, right? It's about writing about or telling the stories about solutions to problems. So a lot of journalism is just about the problems, right? We write journalism about, you know, pollution or traffic jams or um, machet, right? Is that right? Machet, yeah. Um, we, you know, like we write about problems, 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 and like how do they get fixed? How do they get solved? So solutions journalism is, you know, an approach to journalism where what you're trying to do is find people or communities that solved a problem and like not a real unusual problem, like regular problems that lots of communities have. And you write about how did this group or this community solve the problem? And these stories are really popular with audiences because they're positive, they're happy, they make people feel good, right? And they can be useful because if people who live in a place that has the same problem find this story, then maybe they can learn from it and they can use the same technique in their own community and fix their own problem. So I have two examples. And the first one is actually from Indonesia. And this was reported in The Guardian um, by a freelancer who I think lives in Jakarta. I forget. I looked up, but I forget now. So this, the problem is not enough kids in Indonesia have access to books, like books they can keep or books they can read at home, right? So, I mean, obviously we're not talking about really wealthy kids who could just, you know, go to the store and buy a book, but lots of kids don't have any books. And maybe, you know, there's no public library, there's nowhere for them to go borrow a book. So the solution is that regular people like this tuk-tuk driver, they set up a little small library in their tuk-tuk, in their business, in their little food stall or something like that. And they drive around or they invite kids in and they lend books or they give books to kids. And according to the story, actually thousands of people in Indonesia have done this. They're just doing it on their own, like, or they hear about somebody else do it and they're doing it. So it's a very upbeat story. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel like people are good. Um, and that's an example because there is a problem and there are people who are taking care of the problem just like in their own small way. Um, another Indonesian story I found, and I assume that you probably all know about Czech Facta because it's a big deal in Indonesia, right? But this story that was published in the Jakarta Globe talks about it as a solution to a problem, right? So the problem is misinformation, right? People see all this false information and fake news, and then they share it, and too many people are getting this wrong information, and nobody realize, or not nobody, but like lots of people don't even realize that it's wrong, that it's fake. So Check Facto was developed, you know, by people working together, and they're a really large organization. I think there's like, yeah, 6,000, 6,000 people contribute to Check Facto. There's a website. If you haven't seen it, you can Google it. You can look it up. And the story is a solutions journalism story because it talks about the problem and how Check Facta is the solution to the problem. I mean, it doesn't mean all the fake news went away, but there's apparently been a very big improvement ever since Check Facta has grown and you know, started sharing their fact checking. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, take a drink. Okay, 
and I think this is the last of my sort of like types of journalism that are sort of, you know, different from just plain straight down the road journalism. So nonprofit journalism, also called not for profit journalism. It doesn't mean people do it for free. It does not mean that, right? That would be hard. The journalists get paid. It's their full-time job. But the organization is not making a profit. When they get over the top, right, they start to have extra money, like they pay all their bills and they have money left over, they put the money back into the organization. They hire some new journalists. They pay for some, you know, new lawsuit or public record search or something. The extra money that goes over expenses, it goes back into the journalism. So they don't make a profit, but they pay their people. They have offices. They, you know, they have internet they pay for, right? So they are paying their bills um, and they don't accept advertising. And why is that important? When you don't accept advertising, then you don't have advertisers telling you that they're mad at you because you wrote bad things about their company, right? Um, most of the nonprofit journalism organizations um, concentrate on um, uh, investigative reporting, very in-depth, long, deep investigations into corruption, you know, um, corporate, political, you know, all kinds of corruption that is hard to uncover, time consuming, expensive. That's what they focus their attention on. So they don't publish like daily news, you know, that kind of thing. No, they're always running these very deep investigations. Um, so one example of a nonprofit news organization is this one. It's called Inside Climate News. It's been around for um, uh, like uh, 14 years or something like that. Um, and they all their news is focused on climate, climate change, and, and the environment and energy issues, that kind of thing. That they don't cover other topics, and they have been. Uh, winning awards and doing journalism for about 14 years, and they're still, they're very successful, right? But not profitable, not making a profit. Um, the biggest example that I think everybody, every journalist in the U.S. knows about this one, um, they do a lot of investigations about uh, things outside the U.S., um, but they are based in the U.S., and they do, I mean, right now they're, they're doing carcinogens, all kinds of, um, they're looking at, um, you know, emissions from factories and pollutants in the soil. And they're doing this big investigation about, you know, what kinds of pollution is existing in the United States and it shouldn't, and it's actually hurting people. It's making people die. Right. So that's a current uh, investigation they're having. And then over on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that they are also doing other stories that are quite different from that. So they have 100 full time journalists, 100, including one of my former students works there. And, you know, he loves it. You know, he says he feels like he's making a difference. He loves to go to work every day, because he feels like his work is really important. So nonprofit journalism. So that is that list of sort of like flavors or types of journalism that are kind of off from the standard, right? They're not just the standard, straightforward, like regular journalism, okay? So now I'm going to talk a bit about common practices. I'm looking at my time. Okay, I'm good. Okay. Common practices for the digital journalist, right? So, you know, you're making these online and multimedia news stories, you know, what, what are you actually doing, right, day to day? So I've got five different practices that I'm going to talk about, okay? Um, journalists have to collect information, they have to verify it, they have to check it, and they use many techniques to do that, collecting and verifying. 
And they also use various techniques to share news with the public. And I didn't write this here, but also to get feedback from the public, to get input, to, you know, do some sort of participatory journalism or to work with citizen journalists, right? So there's all these kinds of different uh, layers and levels that are going on. And I'm going to talk about five of these. So this one, this is the briefest one, I think, just like news gathering. Before we had digital anything, right? People did interviews and maybe they recorded them on tape or maybe they just took notes, but, you know, journalists have always interviewed their sources, right? So we still do that, right? Um, journalists go to events, journalists go to press conferences, right? Journalists look at public records and try to find information, but now I'm going to mention just four of digital only techniques that have been added to the normal things that journalists still do, right? So one is listening on social media. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean audio. It means like even just like reading Twitter, reading WhatsApp, um, you know, viewing TikTok, um, seeing what people are talking about in Facebook groups, you know, sort of like having your eyes and ears open all the time to see, to find out what are people talking about? What are they worried about? What are they scared of? What are they happy about? What are they asking questions about, right? So social media gives us a way to listen, you know, listen to that kind of thing, just like all the time, right? And I'm, you know, I'm sure that, you know, you do this just naturally to some extent. You know what trends are. Um, you know what's coming up that's important or new. You, you know what the buzz is about, say, some new TV series or a music artist or, you know, anything, right? Um, as journalists, you want to kind of expand your social media listening. Like, as a young person, you've got to focus, you know, you've got like a network of mostly other young people. As a journalist, you want to branch out and you want to listen broader, wider. You want to listen to old people. You want to listen to people outside of Java, right? You want to listen to people in Papua. You want to listen to people in, in um, um, you know, Lombok or, you know, somewhere, you want to listen to people in Sulawesi, right? You want to see, you know, you want to listen, um, particularly if you're working on national news, right? You want to expand, you want to make your ears bigger, right? So you want to like listen to more stuff. You want to subscribe to more groups and newsletters, you know, to like take in information. Second one I have here is Google Trends. So if you go to trends.google.com, you can pull down a menu and you can choose Indonesia. And then you can, <coughs> excuse me, um, you can search for a term like um, vaccine. And you can even, you know, search for the Indonesian word vaccine, right? And you can see a timeline of, and it means how, how many people search for that word in every month of the year. Like you can do that right now while I'm talking and have a look, right? So sometimes um, you start hearing about something, you can go to Google Trends and you can look, okay, you know, are, is, is that on like a, an upward sweep? right? Is that like growing and growing and growing in the public interest, right? Like you can actually see a graph because where, you know, where do people go to look up something they don't know? They put it in Google, right? They type in Google, right? So that's actually visible to all of us. It's just a free thing. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, web searches, of course, is another way that journalists use do digital you know, gathering of information now, right? Um, you're writing about a corporation. You're writing about a street in a city. You're writing about a person. You Google is your friend, right? You go in there, you look for their 
person's name, company name. Um, you search in whatever languages are relevant. And, you know, you like you try to find out what information comes up. You do an image search. You do a text search. You like try to dig around and see what you can find as background on a company, uh, a politician, a political party, anything at all, right? A building that fell down, for example, right? You Google the address of that building. You Google the builder of the building, right? You try to find out, do their other buildings fall down? Anything like that. And the last one is web scraping. And there are ways to do this uh, without uh, code, without programming. Um, but people who know how to program can also write programs to do it. So there's more than one way to do it. And what web scraping is good for is you can collect data, usually numeric data, from government websites, from NGOs, and so forth, where they've got the data on a web page, but there's no spreadsheet that you can download. Scraping is a way that you can collect the data and then you can analyze it. And other journalists maybe didn't think of that. They're not as smart as you. So they don't have the same story that you're getting because you were smart enough to scrape data off some websites. So these are just four examples that I could think of just off the top of my head. And there's more, like there's digital tools, there's ways to, you know, collect information, verify information, because we're sitting at our keyboards all day long, right? So think about how much you have access to that back in the day, um, you know, journalists just couldn't look up all this stuff. Now, a totally different one, another common practice. Now, I had a, a list of topics um, about this class. And it was these two things were sort of written together. And I understand why it makes sense. But it's also kind of, um, well, I'll say I'll just say it in order. Okay, so citizen journalism, I already mentioned, is um, a more widely used term for grassroots journalism. So if you say grassroots journalism, even in America, a lot of people will be like, what is that? If you say citizen journalism, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That's when people like Darnella held up her camera and shot that video. Um, most people know what that is. Um, so it's that idea that a regular person might someday just make journalism because it's like where they are. Live blogging is something that any citizen could do. And also any journalist could do it. But really, like nobody does blogging anymore. Right? Like blogging is a thing that we did 20, 15 years ago, but like, that's not what people do now, because now we use social media, right? And it's different. Um, but the idea of live blogging continues, but now it's not a blog and it's not blogging. It's like you're going to tweet on Twitter or you're going to, you know, you're going to post messages through WhatsApp or you're going to live stream on YouTube or, you know, any number of platforms, right? Um, the key here is that you're going to be doing something live, which connects to, well, something is happening right now. So you're commenting on it while it's happening, or you're reporting to the world. You're telling the world what's happening because you're right there watching it. So the difference between uh, Darnella taking the video and not saying anything and live anything would be that she would have been probably talking the whole time. So using her as an example, obviously the live reporting is not always what we should be doing. Sometimes we should just be capturing the, the, the scene in front of us, right? We should just be recording. But other times, um, you're kind of doing what a reporter in the middle of uh, a protest is doing, 
where they're standing on a dark street at night and, you know, people are, you know, setting things on fire behind them and the reporter is there talking into the camera. Well, other people can be talking into their phones. Right. You don't need a TV crew. You don't need a cameraman. You can just turn your phone, you know, around into, you know, selfie mode and just be, you know, telling the world what's happening right in front of you. So that is a kind of live reporting that anybody can do. And that's the point. That's why it's connected with citizen journalists. Now, if you do it on Twitter, you're not using video and you're not using your voice. You're posting short messages, right? And the reason I bring up Twitter is because Twitter is a large platform and some journalists uh, may have a lot of followers, right? Um, so if they already have a lot of followers and something is happening in their city um, and they happen to be in the middle of it, they could be tweeting and they could be sharing photos on Twitter and that could actually uh, reach a large audience, right? So the platform is not important, but it is important if anybody's seeing it. If you only have 20 followers, it doesn't make much sense for you to be doing that, right? Because who's going to see it? Um, so we see it a lot. We see it during natural disasters. We see it during protests. We see it during riots. Um, so it's a way of sort of bringing the public right into the middle of it. And so it's live. And then the next word is whatever platform you're using. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I just said this about the followers, right? Um, yeah, if you don't have a lot of followers, then it might not make sense to be doing it on your personal, you know, account. Um, you might be able to do it on your employer's account. Like say you work for a TV network, you could be like streaming through their YouTube account. Um, it just, it depends, right? Um, but there are a lot of journalists who develop a big enough following because of the kinds of topics they cover that when they're, when they go live, um, there are a lot of people not only seeing what they report, but they're also retweeting it or resharing it, you know, posting it on Facebook or whatever, so that other people know. And I remember very well um, when we had, when our Capitol was under attack on January 6th and all those crazy people went into our Capitol building, right? It was, it was just nuts. I was seeing it on, uh, uh, was I watching CNN or was I just seeing it online? But I found some reporters who were live tweeting that in the middle of it. And they were posting video and they were posting photos. And so I would share what I saw them, uh, you know, sharing because I knew they were legitimate journalists. So I knew that their information would be accurate. You know, it wasn't some fake thing or a made up thing. So then, you know, people who recognize that person as a legitimate journalist will then retweet or, you know, reshare it in some other way. So let's see. All right. So I don't think I have to tell um, young people like you guys, uh, you know, about social media platforms, right? You know, there are a lot of them. You know that everybody has their favorites. Some people use many platforms. Some people prefer one or another, right? Um when you are a professional journalist, you might be using your personal social media account or more than one account or just one to interact with other journalists and to promote your journalism, even, you know, to the public, right? You might, you might not. You may have as part of your job or your responsibilities managing your company's social media accounts. And that's a whole other thing, because then that's like the official, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, the newspaper's official Twitter account or YouTube account or, you know, the TV stations. And if you're managing that, that's a lot of responsibility, right? You don't want to make a mistake. 
you don't want to, you know, um, have a lawsuit happen, you know, like that's a big deal. Um, but these are things that people do every day. Like they use their personal accounts to promote their journalism. They manage an organization's, you know, uh, official social media accounts. But this last one, I wanted to talk about a little bit because people don't think about this so much that if you are publicly out there as a journalist and your social media accounts are open to your audience, basically, so they know you as a journalist and they can follow you on whatever platforms you and they are on, right? This can lead to them giving you tips giving you information. Um, it can also open it up for you to ask them uh, for, you know, their opinion or their experiences. So one of the things that we see uh, our, our students doing is they will come into a Facebook group about our, our local community. It's called, um, my town is called Gainesville. And so the Facebook group is called Gainesville Word of Mouth. And it's just all a bunch of regular people. And they talk about anything. So sometimes a journalism student comes into that Facebook group and they post and they say, I'm doing a story about people um, who, you know, uh, a common one is, you know, something related to COVID, right? Um, people who don't want to get vaccinated or people who have a relative who doesn't want to get vaccinated or something. And then the student says, if you'd be willing to talk to me, you know, please send me a, a Facebook message or DM me, right? This can kind of have two effects. So sometimes the group that you come into and you post a message like that, they might hate you for it. And they might hate you because they're like, hey, we have our friendly little group here on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever. And who are you? I mean, even though they said very politely, they said, I'm a journalist or I'm a student journalist. And but people are like, get out of here. You know, don't like don't invade our private space. Right. So you have to have some sort of consideration for the kind of space that you're going into. Um, whereas if it's a space that you are always in and people know you there, then, then people can be more open to you making a request like that because they see you as one of them. Right. So it's just another consideration about, you know, this kind of, uh, so another thing is, so say you're interacting with sources on social media. You think you found a great source. They're telling you wonderful stuff. You're like, oh, this is going to be a great story because they're telling me all this stuff. Never forget that people just lie their faces off, right? People tell lies. People tell lies. And not only do they tell lies, they, they just can make themselves into a fake person. Right. So you might know a person on social media and you think you know them, but really they're like a 10 year old kid who's really smart and they're pretending to be an adult. Right. Um, or, you know, or something like, you know, they're saying that they're this kind of person, but really they're not that kind of person at all. They're, you know, they say they're in Jakarta and actually they live in, you know, I don't know, Surabaya or somewhere. Like they're like some totally, they say they're a lawyer, but actually they're, uh, you know, a taxi driver. Right. So just, you know, you think, you know, somebody on social media, but you just don't know anything. Right. So you have the same responsibility to make sure that anything you're reporting is accurate and true. And you can't just you can't just go into some kind of forum or group and quote things that people are saying in there for this exact reason. Right. Because the people who are saying these things might just be they might not be who they pretend to be. Right. So it's dangerous to just say people on social media are talking about this and a person 
you know, with this handle or this, you know, avatar or whatever they said this or did this. It's like it could just all be wrong. Um, so the the need to actually check in other ways, right? Like have them send you some kind of verification, like they send you some kind of document, photos, whatever, um, before you go claiming that what they said is true or that they are whatever they said they are. Just be careful because people lie. Now, another topic altogether, um, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. Are two entirely different things. Well, not in, they both use crowds, right? But they're different. So crowdsourcing is getting people to contribute to your story, okay? Or to contribute to your journalism, contribute information, not money. Um, the word crowd, though, is important. So this is not just plain old participatory journalism or citizen journalism. This is often the journalist's ask a lot of people, kind of like the Cicada Project, right? You ask a lot of people to help you with the story, to either work on, you know, like uh, finding something, recording something. And I'll give you an example on the next slide, right? But crowdsourcing is like using a crowd of people all as sources for the same thing. Um, you're not taking a poll. You're actually asking them to like do something uh, or contribute some kind of information. Crowdfunding has the word funding in it because, yes, it's about money. So there are some journalists, not, not millions, right? Not, not a lot. But there are some journalists who have figured out a way to get paid by their audience. And often what happens is they are somebody in a specialized area that, um, you know, uh, um, several dozen or a couple of a hundred people maybe really care about, like reporting on some kind of issue in a particular place. And, you know, the regular news media don't care about this issue. It's not important enough for them to follow it all the time. If this journalist has a track record, a reputation for making good journalism about this topic, they can set up a GoFundMe page or a Patreon page. I've got a couple links here on the slide. And they can say, but only if you have a reputation, right? Because if nobody knows who you are, like nobody's going to care. You can say, give me money, but nobody's going to give you any money, right? But you've built up a reputation over six months or a year. Like you are writing about, you know, how those whales are getting killed by the fishermen or something like that, right? And you are on it. Like you have the contacts, you have the photos, you have this, you know, this reputation and, you know, your employer is like, quit writing about that, write about some other stuff. You go to your public, you go to your fans, basically, and you say, if, if you know, if, if, um, if this many people would give me $100 a month, I could do this full time for a year. And some people actually get that back, right? So that is crowdfunding. It's crowd because they're not asking somebody to give them their whole paycheck, right? They're not asking for one rich person to give them a lot of money. They're saying, look, if everybody who loves my journalism gives me a small amount, not too small, but, you know, gives me this much every month or this much every week, I could support myself and I could just do this journalism and quit my regular job and just do this. So is everybody clear on the way these two things are different? All right. Crowdsourcing, similar to participatory journalism or something, but crowd, right? You need a lot of people. Funding, again, a crowd, but like totally different. You're not asking for information. You're asking for money. Um, so this is a really old example, but I just like it because it's more visual than some. And uh, there's this large city in the U.S. called uh, Minneapolis. And apparently their roads are really messed up. 
they have big holes and the government never fixes them and people's tires get damaged and their cars get damaged. And so this is a, a public radio station. And the, so the radio station puts this map on their website and on the radio, they say, we have a pothole map. Please come to our website and, you know, put your mouse on the map and show us where the bad potholes are that you drive on every day. And they actually had this page up for years. I think it was like five or six years. And they got dozens of stories out of it. And they shamed the government into fixing a lot of the potholes. Some of the potholes that, you know, people sent them photographs of the holes in the street. And then the journals would go out and verify and take more pictures. And then they'd go back like a month later and the hole was bigger and they they put another picture, right? So they got a lot of response from the government, which was a good result. It was kind of a solution, right? There was a problem. They got a solution. Anyway, but the, the crowd part was they needed the people in that city to come and mark the locations of the potholes, right? And so it's uh, why this is a good example of crowdsourcing is also there are lots more people who came and put a mark on the map than there are journalists who work for this radio station, right? So the crowd is like having an extra big workforce to help you out, right? The, you know, your, your little number of reporters couldn't possibly find all these potholes, but when you ask the whole public, please help us find the potholes, then they come in and they kind of like do, do the investigation for you or like the initial investigation. Um, and like when you, uh, you, you rolled over one of the markers on the map, you got the information and you can see here like three people pointed out this one pothole that I selected, right? And it was first reported six days ago. Well, that's in a computer database, that number is going to change automatically because when a person comes to their website, puts the mark on the map, all this stuff goes into a database and this information is updated over time without the reporters having to touch it, right? So it was a really nice example of something that really helped the city improve and you got the people to contribute. So it's not asking them to do too much, right? I think it's always sometimes um, people are like, why would the public do this for free? Well, it only takes a minute, right? Like who needs to get paid for spending like maybe five minutes, right? Doing this, right? So it's like just, you know, but if 1,000 people spend five minutes, then you really have a lot. Then you have something really good, right? Hang on, I'm losing my voice here. Okay, so this is a kind of a longer one. And this, now, I do not know if Andika and Gumgum and Dandi are going to use the assignment that I sent because I only sent it to them a few hours ago. But I wrote an assignment for you, for you in the class, you students, um, where you would make a story using curation or aggregation. So pay attention because this might be your assignment. Um, so aggregation and curation are very, they're closely related, but they're not exactly the same. Um, so when we aggregate, it means we gather a lot of things together and like make a meaningful whole out of a lot of things that we brought together. Curating or to curate suggests that maybe we already have a large collection, but we're going to pick a very small number of good things and kind of highlight them. Um, so an example of curation is often uh, where you already work for a news organization or a magazine or something like that, and you're curating like 
a selected small amount of your past articles, like not just your own, but like the whole organizations, right? Um, aggregation could come from, you know, other news organizations or, you know, other things just outside the place you work for. Um, what the two have in common is that the reason you're doing this, and this is important if you do do this assignment, right? You're not doing this just to make, you know, a web page or a social media post that has a lot of links, or like you could do a Twitter thread, right? Um, but nobody just wants a lot of links. Like we can all find links on our own. Like everybody knows how to Google, right? They don't need you to Google for them. So the key to this practice of curation is that you're going to really sift and judge and pick things that are actually really good, like really good, like the best ones. You're going to save the reader time and effort because you're going to do the selection. You're going to find, it's like, um, say you and all your friends love horror movies. And somebody comes and says, I have, you know, researched everything. And I have a list of like the four scariest horror movies of, you know, from every country, from every time period, I've got four. And why don't we all watch them? Wouldn't you be interested? Right? If, if, they're, if they're saying, you know, I've really found, I'm sure that these are the four scariest horror movies, right? Not just, these are four horror movies I randomly found in a Google search. That's no good, right? So this idea of value, like it's a really carefully chosen, valuable, small list. That's an important part of this, right? And if it's news, if it's like true journalism stuff and not horror movies, it's also important that everything in the collection or the set is from a very reliable source. So if I am going to give you a short list of articles about vaccines or about COVID or about wearing a mask, I am going to make sure that you know that the source for this one was like the government health authority. The source for this other one was the New York Times. The source for this other one was, you know, like CNN. The source for this other one was like the White House, the current White House, not the previous one, right? Like, I'm going to let you know that my sources are impeccable. And so that's also part of this, right? So I'm not going to read through this, but the gist is that if I was making a list of articles about climate change, but I was tying it to the current climate meeting that's happening in Scotland or just, just ended in Scotland, right? So say I want to share with my readers some very important articles that my newspaper published about climate over the past two years. I'm not going to give them a list of 20. Nobody's ever going to like that list, right? That's too many. So I'm going to pick a short and good list. I'm going to make sure each of the articles is different from all the other ones because nobody wants to like read the same thing twice, right? I'm going to make sure that I write a little paragraph about each one and make it clear. How is this related to that current international meeting? Because that's my reason for making this list, right? And so I've got links. I have made the list small. I have used my intelligence and my discretion to pick only the good articles and to make sure they don't repeat each other. And I'm going to write a little short paragraph, like two sentences about each one so that a person in my audience can actually learn a lot 
without even clicking any links. Right? Like just my paragraphs and the headlines will be valuable and interesting. But then for a few readers, like a small subset of readers, they're going to want to click at least one link. And when they do, they're going to be very satisfied because I picked something really good for them. Does this make sense? Right? So the point of making a curated list is not just to quickly fill up, you know, something and put something out there. It's to actually produce like a beautiful little handcrafted thing that's nice for the audience that cares about this, this topic. Um, now, I don't know if you have email newsletters in Indonesia. Are they a thing? Is that something common? I know you guys aren't big on email. Not really. Yeah. We, you know, we in, in every, every professional person in every field in the United States is just a slave to email. Like we get emails from our bosses. We get emails from clients. I get email. We have, you know, email. Some days email takes me three hours in the morning. I try to never let that happen, but sometimes, you know, so it's a thing. So you'd think that people would not want more email, but they do. <laughs> because, and this is just two examples. The slide you're looking at here, two examples. Now, for all the women in the class, I want to mention that the one on the left side, the daily skim, this was a phenomenon. This was two young women quit their jobs and said, we're going to write a daily newsletter Monday through Friday. We're going to send it out by email and we're going to, we're going to um, make money. We're going to like, this is going to be our new job. And, and it worked. It happened. This is their full-time job. This is what they do. They actually hired staff. They've got, and they make tons of money and articles have been written about it. And if you, I, I, what I link to in these two links, I link to one day's newsletter that's out on the web. So like, you don't have to sign up and get it in your email that you don't ever look at, <laughs> but people all over North America subscribe to these newsletters and it's just like a, uh, like a fun and they're just written in these sort of brief, punchy, breezy ways. They're, they're very clever. They're very well crafted. And the point here is that they are just curated stuff from other sources. Like these two women who write the Daily Skim, they are not doing any original reporting at all. They are reading, 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 and watching videos and listening to news reports. You know, they're like consuming the media universe for us. And then they, they cut it down to this fun, fast, short, funny, quirky little set of like maybe eight little like snippets. And people love it. Some newsletters cost money. Some newsletters are free and they make their money from advertising. Um, the one on the right is more traditional. The Wall Street Journal is a very famous business newspaper. Um, and I get this one myself. Actually, I get the Daily Skim, but I never read it. <laughs> I get it, but I never open it. But the Wall Street Journal one, I do because they pick out these stories and it, it's better than a front page of anything. It's better than any Facebook group or social media feed. It's just like, you know, it's like six or eight short, sharp summaries. And it's like all I need to know. And I, I pretty much never click any of the links, but the links are there. So I always know if I want to know more, it's there. But like, usually I don't want to. 
So it's a whole phenomenon. I don't know if it would work in Indonesia because I know like you guys don't check your email. You don't live by email the way we do. Um, but I did put this slide in so that you could, you know, look at two examples if you feel like it by clicking the links. And also, um, this is a really successful or these newsletters. There's many, many, many. You can Google like um, best journalism newsletter. And there's newsletters about fiction. There's newsletters about movies. There's newsletters about memes. You know, like you can subscribe to an email newsletter that every day gives you like the eight best memes. And like, they're, it's crazy. There are like so many. Um, but the curation, the ones that are like related to journalism, they really are like this time saver. It's kind of like they, they look at hundreds of things and give you six. And they're like, these are the six most interesting things we found. So it's kind of nice. Um, so aggregation, not curation. Aggregation usually is in some way automated. Meaning, you know, it's automatic. It's just like, you know, there's a feed of some kind or, you know, it's the it's the 10 most popular articles from yesterday. So, you know, like a computer can figure that out and just give you those links and those headlines. And so there's often no human creativity in aggregation. So curation is more the human intelligence. But the aggregation types, as you can see here, they go from 100% automated down partly, just a small bit, and then not automated at all. At that point, it's kind of the same as curation. So just so you know about that. Um, this is an example. There's a website called the Journalist Resource. And they provide all kinds of sort of background material for journalists. And I went on their site looking for something else. And I saw, oh, look at this. They had a list of the 10 most popular posts from their website, which they kind of run like a blog. Um, the list is automatic, right? It's the 10 most popular posts from a whole year. But it's automatically generated because, you know, their content management system can say, OK, you know, a million people read this one, half a million people read this one. So here's the top 10. Right. So nobody had to curate anything. But if you notice, somebody, some journalist wrote a short paragraph about each one. So the blue text is a link and it's also the headline of the first most popular post, the second most popular, but the paragraph below is like a little summary that some person actually wrote. It's not the first paragraph of the story. So this is an example of our, our aggregation with a little bit of like human uh, intelligence added to it. Um, so this, if, if you get the assignment, these three, uh, two words and a phrase are in that too, right? So when you're curating, whatever size your list is, right? If it's five things or 10 things or whatever you're giving people, each one needs a link. Each one needs an attribution. Where did it come from? That's how you like prove that it's good, right? And third, it needs, you need, as the journalist, you need to add value to, like, you're not just giving a list of links. You're also adding value by providing, like, a paragraph like this. And, again, the idea is, there we go. Um, the idea is that you really don't expect most readers to click the links right? You're not giving them the links so that they click all of them. Nobody has time to do that, but you're giving them the links and a little summary of each thing as a way of creating new value that didn't exist before. Um, are there any questions? 
or if there's just somebody's mic is on. Somebody's mic is on. Um, okay, let me see if I need to say anything about this. You link directly to the source. You write out the name of the source. You summarize. I think I've said all that. All right, so let's see. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. Oh, good. Okay. So this is the final section of my lecture for today. Um, I'm going to talk about four emerging media formats. Now, I think you've probably heard of all of these, and maybe you've even used some of them, but we'll see. I don't know. Um, so these are the four, okay? So emerging media refers to newer technologies, right? So not video, not print, digital technologies, and you know, these probably are not something that an Indonesian news organization is going to do. Most U.S. news organizations don't do any of these things. Like the biggest ones, like the New York Times does all these things, right? But they're huge and they're rich. And, you know, most news organizations don't. But um, they're interesting, they're new, they're only possible because of our digital technologies, so they're pretty interesting. And a lot of news organizations have experimented with these, at least in a small way, right? Or like, you know, one or two journalists will experiment with them. So I, I think uh, Dean Dadong looks a little bit scary in his mask <laughs> from that angle. <laughs> We're we're like looking at your chin and you're like this big black mask here. <laughs> okay, so the first one is augmented reality, right? And you might know this this term, augmented reality. You might know it as AR. Um, to augment something means that you add to it or you enhance it, you make it better. Okay. Um, so augmented reality is like reality but better reality with something added to it. And the usual way that people experience AR is using a mobile phone. So like you're going to point the back of your phone at something and you're going to be watching on the screen like what the camera sees, but also something extra added to it. Okay. Um, and the example I wrote here is a common one that people try the first time they try to make something with AR. They like go to a historic place in their city or on their campus and they add stuff so that while you're walking around and like you're pointing this way and you're pointing that way, whoops, sorry, um, you know, like, like different things appear on top of, you know, I'm pointing at a building on the campus and on top of the image of the building while I'm walking around, I get some text that tells me something interesting or I get like little photographs from the past, the way it looked in the past. So that's a kind of example. Now, the most common example is Pokemon Go, right? And I'm assuming like everybody saw that, even if you didn't play it yourself, right? You saw somebody doing this, right? Yes, no, I see some nodding, right? So this of course is a game and it's fun and you know, like, like, Millions of people all around the world just loved it. Um, and this is AR on your phone. The thing is that you can make three-dimensional figures or two-dimensional images or text or whatever appear in the same way based on what the phone camera is pointing at, right? And so this can be done... Um, like I said, to like provide a historical tour or something like that, right? To, um, you know, some real estate companies are using it to like sort of visualize how would the space in an office building look and you know, things like that. Um, so some journalism organizations have experimented with this and there are actually free tools so you might not experiment with it as part of a class, but you might want to play with it on your own in your free time. Like you can download this tool set to make AR with Facebook and it's free. And all you have to do is go to the link that's in my slide deck. 
And you know what? In case somebody came in and they can't see that, I'm just going to throw the link in there one more time. Because I know sometimes if you join late, you can't see the link. Okay. Um, not only does Facebook have a free AR toolkit, but um, Snapchat also does. And I bet TikTok does. I just didn't look at all of them, right? So you can get started with AR for free, like just using your own phone. Um, I have not played with this stuff. I don't have time, but I think it would be fun if I had some free time and I thought I could do something cool with it. Now, second uh, emerging technology that I want to talk about is 360 degree visuals. Now, a lot of you have probably seen a 360 degree photo. Uh, a lot of people paste these on face post post these on Facebook. Um, I think the 360 degree photo is usually kind of boring because you just kind of slide to the left and the right and you don't see that much. Um, where this is really cool is when it's a video and it goes really 360, like you can see the whole sky, you can see the ground, you can see left and right the whole way around. Um, you know, so not a still photo, but an actual moving, changing video, and you can look in every direction, right? So this is not virtual reality. I'll talk about that in a minute, but the cameras are the same. So you see that you either have you know, a particular camera that's built a certain way, or you have a bunch of cameras that are put together in a frame. And then the video editing that takes place afterward is some complicated thing that I, I am never going to learn to do myself. Um, but I know people who do it and, you know, they have to have, you know, pretty, a pretty powerful computer. Like I think mine would probably like melt down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's a thing that you can do. And yes, there are some news organizations that have experimented with this, particularly the New York Times. They, they really played with this a lot for a long time, um, but I don't think they do much with it anymore. And you can see their examples on YouTube. So this link is in uh, the slides, or you can just Google 360 VR on, on YouTube and you'll see this. Okay, virtual reality is different. Okay, virtual reality is what you experience when you're wearing one of these special headsets. And when you've got this, this headset on, uh, you know, covering up your eyes completely, and you're standing and you're moving around you really feel like you're in the place because what you're looking at isn't a still picture, it's a video. And the one that I uh, experienced that made the biggest impression on me was from the New York Times. And it was a bunch of people sitting in the back of an open truck, kind of like, like a farm truck. And it was going down a bumpy road and the position of me, you know, wearing the, it's like I was sitting in the truck with like four other people who were talking and laughing. And so like when I turned my head, I was actually looking at these people and it was so weird. And I looked down and I saw some legs that weren't my legs. Right. So like you really are immersed in this other environment. So it's pretty interesting. And there's been some research about how making a virtual reality experience um, can actually help people understand other cultures and other like other kind of life situations, like how refugees feel when like they're entering a new place, right? So some organizations are doing some pretty interesting stuff with uh, VR. Um, the last emerging media thing I wanna talk about is uh, much, much simpler to work with, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So when we use the word bot, that is a word that comes from the word robot. But when we think of a robot, we sort of, 
think about Lieutenant Data from Star Trek or, you know, some, you know, robot Terminator. Um, so bots are generally just software, right? There's no body, there's no walking, talking machine, right? Um, but it's called a bot because it is automated, right? And what's automated is a conversation or just communication. So it's programmed by computer programmers, but it can have a back and forth with you, right? So Siri and Alexa and uh, virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa and the Google one, um, they're not referred to as bots. They're referred to as voice assistants, but a bot can run on a social media platform, such as Twitter or Facebook. Um, a bot can be on a web page in a little, like a chat window, and it can do customer service, or it can help you pick out a new bicycle or something like that, like you answer questions or you ask questions. So it's just a computer program, but it's a way of interacting back and forth with language, with text usually. They can use voice. There's, you know, you can program them to do it with voice, but um, often they're just text, right? Um, so a lot of news organizations have used <clears throat> chatbots to help the audience understand a story better. And there's different examples that you could Google online where they set up a chatbot and basically somebody like comes to a web page and they ask questions. And the bot has pre-programmed answers, but it's got this little interactivity and the, you know, the results, the, you know, analysis shows that a lot of people in the audience really enjoy this. They, they just like the back and forth a little bit more than just sitting and reading for some reason. I personally don't, but a lot of people do, right? So there are chat bots that you can use that are already, you know, programmed and set up, and then you can modify them in WhatsApp, in Facebook Messenger, on Twitter, et cetera. Like probably every social media platform you can think of has one. And I just put in one screenshot because I know WhatsApp is very popular in Indonesia. And I, I just Googled like WhatsApp chat book chatbot and I found there's like this whole free tutorial online like if you want to build a chatbot in whatsapp you could build one like this week so again that link is on the slide it's a free tutorial it's like tells you everything you have to do and you could like build a chatbot and check it out um, this kind of thing if you're interested in it it's often easier if two or three students work together because, you know, like the thing that stumps one student or confuses them, like another one will be like, oh, I understand what that is. And then vice versa. So it, it can be a nice little group project, I think, to maybe build a chatbot. So I have come to the end of my very long lecture. Oh, and I'm so tired <laughs> because it's 10 o'clock at night. It is my bedtime. Um, I have this one page summary here of what I've talked about. So. Obviously, it's not everything, but I talked a little bit about how digital journalism can be packaged in many different ways, right? Depending on the platform, but not only the platform, right? What's the story you're trying to tell? What is the audience it's for, right? So all kinds of choices. Every story is different. Number two, people have all these different sources for information. So you got to remember that every time you're making a journalism story and you want to put it out there, you are in competition with these millions of fun and interesting things that everybody has access to. So we really have to work hard nowadays. Like we have to make our stories really good and really, you know, like, tight and to the point and not waste people's time, right? And, and be interesting. Um, number three, all these people who are not trained professional journalists might on any day somehow find themselves in a situation where they make some journalism, right? 
Something happens in front of them. And the next thing you know, they're on Twitter and 10 million people are sharing everything that they said because of, you know, they, that just happened. And that happens because everybody has this phone. Everybody has the internet. We're all connected. So anybody could report on what's happening in front of them at any time. Number four, we have all kinds of new techniques that we can use, such as curation, that's only one. And five, the last thing I talked about was there are these emerging media formats. Emerging media is a term that replaced new media because like a lot of it's not new anymore. Like virtual reality is like 20 years old. Only 20 years ago, it wasn't nearly as good, right? But like we've had that that term. And anyway, so emerging media is like stuff that's really new and different. And the four things I talked about aren't even all that new, um, but they're sort of like different ways of engaging an audience that for some stories, maybe you want to think about. And I think, yes, that is everything I've got for you. So you've got a link to these slides. And on every slide, not every slide, on many slides, there's a link at the bottom to like, if I showed an example of a story, there's a link to the story, right? So if you're interested in anything, just have a look at the slides. And also if there's anything I talked about that I talked a little fast or, you know, my English was like some, some words that you don't personally know, obviously you've got these slides they are Google Slides. You can just like open them up anytime and you can throw it into Google Translate and, you know, have a better idea what I was trying to get across to you. So at this point, even though I'm tired, I would be happy to answer questions if you have some questions. And the whole thing with the assignment, I'm going to leave to your lectures because uh, like I said, I don't know if it's the assignment that they actually want you to do or not. So I will leave that to them. Um, so uh, you can talk to me in the chat. You can talk to me with your voice. Um, you can like private message Andika and ask him to translate <laughs> or, you know, any of the above. Right. Well, Thank you, Mindy, for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience uh, with us regarding the formats of online and multimedia news packaging. Uh, so much to so much interesting material to discuss today, and I hope you still have time. I know it's late back in the U.S. Uh, <laughs> around 10 p.m., uh, but I hope you can still hang on and uh, answer some of the questions from our students. Uh, right. Uh, uh, again, a lot, a lot of interesting materials to discuss. However, I uh, I agree that that uh, up the point that you mentioned earlier uh, regarding uh, as uh, we practice online journalism, it is very important to know your audience. Uh, we should be able to facilitate our online readers to to pick and choose what they want to read. As an example that you mentioned earlier about the uh, news of the condo in Florida, uh, mm -hmm. which I which I saw uh, which I saw the building collapse on CNN Indonesia about mm -hmm. around back in June, I think. Very yeah, devastating, June. right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, the example that you gave us, uh, I think it was the Miami Herald, was it? Yeah. Right. Uh, an interesting way of how to. Uh, formulate the news package to facilitate the audience to be able to pick and choose what they want to read. So I think it's important to know your audience. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, points that you mentioned about, uh, especially on uh, aggregation and curation. And to answer your question about will be will will our students be working on the assignment that you gave us? Of course mm -hmm. they will. Oh, okay. Of course they will. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I hope that they uh, paid attention to uh, that part of the material that you gave us about aggregation and creation. Uh, the difference that uh, how they should be able to dif differentiate between aggregation and creation, uh, which aggregation is how we gather things together from various sources into a meaningful, meaningful whole. 
and curation is about selecting what you already have in your collection or uh, the media that you work for, for example. And uh, rules for aggregation and curation, which is very important as well. I hope they will be able to implement all the rules uh, for the assignment, which is uh, how to link directly to the source, how to attribute uh, or write the name of the source, because you also mentioned that uh, the uh, one of the powerful elements of uh, aggregation and curation uh, news packaging is uh, uh, how we should uh, uh, write the name of the source, which will uh, add credibility to our packages and also to add value, summarize and say something useful about what we write. So I think... Uh, uh, and regarding the emerging of news, uh, emerging uh, media formats, I think as uh, our young students should be able to uh, explore uh, themselves, you know, about how they can uh, use augmented reality uh, uh, through the Spark AR toolkit, which they can use for Facebook and Instagram, and also uh, virtual reality and least but not least how they can uh, work as a group together to uh, make chat bots for WhatsApp, which is very popular in Indonesia. So I know. Right, very popular, but I'm not sure if they are aware about chat bot, but it's something interesting and something that they can explore. Uh, right, well, uh, I think we have uh, still time for our students to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Silakan teman-teman yang ingin bertanya. I don't think that they have to ask me first and I should translate because they I'm sure they have uh, their English is very fluent already. So silakan. Anyone? Bisa? Anyone else? Okay, satu dulu ya. Okay. Silakan, Pisha. Okay, good morning, Professor Mindy. Thank you for your great presentation, and it's an honor for me to meet you today. I prefer to ask my question uh, verbally because if I put it on the chat, it might be very much of grammatical error and stuff. So <laughs> I really want to ask, um, you already said that actually emerging media formats may not be very compatible for Indonesia. And all I want to ask is, is it worth it to make a more different journalism packaging? Maybe it relates like the contemporary journalism, like the one that you told us about the collapsed building at the beginning that is more time consuming and take more costs. Especially in the country where the actuality of the news, the traffic is more important because their first purpose is to gain a profit. And behalf of that, do you agree that journalists in this era should masterize at graphic design or making program like the Collapse of Building News to present news in the more modern ways? Maybe as a journalism students in Indonesia, we can prepare that skills as soon as possible. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, was, that, was there a question there? Yes, the question is, is it worth to make uh, that kind of programs? And ah, is it like... Okay. Uh, so masterize uh, more than or just writing or producing in news that based on writings or making a video or photography like that. Um, what what the news organizations in the U.S. have found that they often get um, more people, and the people spend a longer time with the story uh, when there are data graphics and charts. So that's one particular thing. I assume in some other part of your course, somebody will talk about that. Um, but uh, those things are, you know, um, time consuming to produce and um, they, you know, people, you know, journalists have to learn how to produce them correctly. Um, but there is a, a, a payback, right, that um, people in the audience actually spend more time on those stories and they share them more and so forth. So sometimes, <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes um, the extra effort and the extra time is worth it. 
but the journalists just have to, I don't know, like take a practical point of view, right? Is it a story that is ongoing? Are a lot of people interested in it, right? And also sometimes maybe you want to think about, you know, people from outside Indonesia, you know, are they interested? So I think, um, you know, one of these things like when, when a volcano is erupting, right? That, you know, people from all around the world want to know more about that. And, um, you know, there can be video, right? Um, there can be uh, information graphics, like showing what's happening. There can be a map. You can use um, Google Earth to produce very nice maps, right? So somebody doesn't have to draw the map from scratch, but, you know, so that people know where is Gunung Merapi, right? Like people outside Indonesia don't even know where that is. And so when something, I just say a volcano because, you know, your typical disaster that's going on and on and on for weeks, like, you know, we have these terrible fires right now in California. And they're, you know, they just never end. Like, you know, it's like California is burning all the time. And uh, a lot of news organizations produce a lot of maps and a lot of stories about, um, you know, the cost of the fire, how many firefighters are there, and people are interested. And so they come back again and again. So the short version of that answer is it really depends on the story and the interest that you see from the public. Because when the public is hungry for more about a story, like you can give them more things than you normally would. Is that, does that answer what you were asking? Yes, it's answered, Professor. Okay, all right, good. I see there's like a very long thing in the chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we have another question from Shahid uh, Lukman. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me try to translate it for him. Uh -huh. uh, he, 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 he asked that the, uh, all around the world and, Indone in, and in, in Indonesia in particular, uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot of non-journalists who also become content and news creators, but mm -hmm. uh, they don't uh they they don't uh think about the ethics uh, for journalism and often uh unfortunately such content like that is more liked by the readers and uh and uh and those kind of topics is, that are often also published in uh media institutions in indonesia his question is in today's uh digital era should uh, education journalism should be uh, reached by the general public as well or uh, do journalists have to be more professional in creating news or content that's his question ah uh, i i think there's a, a third way so since these uh you know regular people right these citizens right since they are so interested in producing their their type of journalism but um, as uh, Shaid, is it? As, as Shaid said, yeah. Um, uh, they're not very good at it, maybe. <laughs> or, you know, they make mistakes. Um, they don't maybe understand the ethics. What would be great would be if journalists would um, have some kind of collaboration with them. So I know when I was in Indonesia, um, the embassy in Jakarta invited me a couple of times to meet with some of those groups, those groups of, of Indonesian citizen journalists. And so we would meet together and they would talk to me and ask me questions about um, actually sometimes they asked directly about the ethics. And they didn't know they were asking about ethics, but they would, they would say, they would say like, is it all right for me to copy photographs from the website of the newspaper and use them in my blog? Because back then we had blogs, right? And I'd say no, because that photograph is owned by the newspaper. You're stealing their photograph, right? 
but they knew to ask the question. They asked, you know, is it all right? And I said, it's actually against the law. And they were like, oh, right. So, so, but they, they didn't argue. They didn't tell me, oh, that's, that's wrong, you know, or I should be, you know, they didn't argue about it. Right. So I think they're open to learning the right way to do things. And so I think um, uh, everybody would be, um, would, would have a, a better experience if the two sides could uh, like share, share information. And, you know, journalism organizations could also have workshops um, and, you know, almost preferably free workshops, right? Like, you know, like, like the more truth there is in the society, the better for everybody, right? But you're right, because they're not trained, they make some terrible mistakes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, does that answer your question, Sahid? Yes, thank you. You have a mm -hmm. follow-up question. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Right, so we have another question from Midrar. Silakan Midrar. Yeah, terima kasih, Pak. Uh, so, Mindy, I want to ask questions regarding uh, newsletters and uh, how newsletters is, you said, 100% is creation, right? And so I was wondering, like, newsletter usually intended to a specific, a specific people needs. Um, demographics or those who really like something or those who have interest in this or um, have uh, want to know much more about this so is there a line we have to draw between something that is very specific but on on, on the other hand it is a journalism product or as long as because newsletters uh, especially emerging platforms like substack right where you can make your own newsletters and then uh, you can people can people, uh, people can subscribe to you so is there a draw we have to line i mean let's say i want to make a, a newsletter and then i want uh, to report on something very specific or something that i found interesting and i want people to find it interesting too is there like so so where to draw the line uh, like like you said because it can be anything right it can be about memes it can be about it can like, be so. anything. yeah so first it can be anything but second to build an audience of course you don't have a big audience the first day or even you know the first year maybe right so if if you really are passionate about it and, and you want to make a newsletter, you're, you're going to have to do it five days a week, you know, five days a week, every week, no stopping, you know, put it out there on time because that's how you build the audience. Right. So um, I think the topic can be anything. The audience that you're aiming for can be any kind of audience, but the third part is that commitment. And I have, you know, uh, sort of scanned over a few articles where um, people who are doing these newsletters talk about how much work it is and how much time it is, right? So it's it's good and bad together, right? It's like a okay. great thing. You, like you get to do exactly what you love, right? But on the other hand, it's it's really a lot of work to make it good every single day, right? Like you can take two days off a week, but really you need to like put it out there five days a week. Well, okay, I should say not everybody, some newsletters are only one day a week, but they have to be consistent. Like if your newsletter comes out once a week, it has to come out on the same day at the same time every week, right? It's kind of a consistency thing so people know that they expect it. And then they, you know, kind of, uh, they get used to it and they become your fan and they, you know, share it with their friends and so forth. 
Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. You mainly seems like you were asking, like, is there any line? Like, you know, the newsletter can be, you know, any any topic at all, right? Um, but uh, again, you know, most of them are really curation. So the newsletter is not really the place to like write all your personal feelings or, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's really, you know, you're going to um, consume this large amount of information and then produce this edited uh, small version of it, right? Does that answer your question? Okay, I think I got the point. Thank you, Mindy. Okay. Okay, terima kasih, Peter. Okay, we have another question from Rosiana. Uh, silakan. Okay. Uh, okay, hello, uh, Professor Mindy. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I have a question, and this might stray a little bit, but um, uh, I've heard a lot in America, especially the term uh, fake news. Oh, yeah. And with the yeah, and with the uh, emergence of these, uh, let's say, breakthrough or new kinds of. Uh, journalism how do you um what is the best way for the media or for journalists to gain back that trust that maybe have been lost from the public or how do you keep that trust from the public with these uh new kind of emergence of uh this kind of journalism thank you you, you know it's in the answer to that is not really about the new kinds of journalism in my opinion Um, we have had this, you know, explosion of fake news that um, it centers on Facebook and Facebook groups. Now, there's also some of it on TikTok and other platforms, um, but there have been a lot of articles about how Facebook's algorithms really um, uh, kind of dangerously make it spread more than anybody had at first realized. So that makes sense. So because Facebook's programming is specifically designed to keep people looking at Facebook, right? So anything that you like, or you spend time with, Facebook wants to give you more of the same thing and more and more and more. So if you are looking at fake news uh, and things that say, for example, you know, there's a lot of groups in the United States that say the COVID vaccine is something bad. And so if a person is looking at that kind of information on Facebook, Facebook's programming will give them more and more and more of the same terrible stuff. And after a while, that person, of course, they think it's true because everything that's coming to them says vaccines are bad. And then we have all these people who, you know, in, in my country, they could get the vaccine for free. Anybody could get it. And we have all these crazy people that won't get it. And then they get sick and they're surprised. I, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's the biggest example. It's the most terrible example of fake news. Right. But I don't, to answer your question, I don't think it has to do with any new form of journalism. Right. It, it has to do with um, very much with Facebook specifically. And the way that the social media platform is designed to keep people staying on Facebook and opening Facebook 1,000 times a day, right? Um, so um, how can journalists regain the trust that they should have, that they have lost? That is a hard question because the journalists don't have any power over Facebook, right? And we, we talk about this all the time and we're just so um, 
I mean, we haven't given up. But it's a very hard problem. And we, we, we literally, everybody in journalist, journalism talks about this all the time. What can we do? Because these people won't read or watch a legitimate journalist, right? They, they won't go to the New York Times and read that journalism and believe it. They won't even look at the New York Times because they have decided that the New York Times is wrong. Um, and we don't know what to do. It's, it's really horrible. We don't know what to do about it. And obviously, it's not everybody. You know, like lots of people in the United States still understand what the truth is and what real journalism is and what science is, right? But way too many people have become some kind of, you know, sometimes we think they're crazy people. Like, how can they believe this stuff? And, and yet we really don't know what to do about it. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm sorry. That's not a happy answer. We are very <laughs> frustrated. We just don't know what to do about these it's The people. reality. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we have one more. We have one, uh, we still have time for one more question from Pakria. Silakan Pakria. Okay. Terima kasih Pak kesempatannya. Uh, hello, Professor Mindy. Thank you for hello. your presentation. Um, it's really insightful. Uh, I've been curious about this. I want to know about your opinion about the newsletter one because they 100% creation, right? Do you think it's fair for other media that be a source for the newsletter because they must have been working hard to do interview, collected a lot of data, and do the verification? Meanwhile, mm -hmm. newsletter only cited it to also they add links so just to appreciate their work. Then does it have anything to do with the journalism ethic or it has nothing to do with it? Thank you, Mindy. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, so one, one part of the answer is that because good curation and good newsletters always include the link to the original story, right? So if I am reading the newsletter and it's the first time I ever found out about, say, your journalism story in your newspaper, right? The only reason I know about that is because I'm reading in the newsletter, right? So the newsletter did not take anything away from your article, right? In fact, they might have inspired me, the audience, to click on their link and read your article for the first time. Right. So there's that. So good curation is not stealing. Right. It is providing the link to the original. And it's also the little summary or the writing that they do about what they link to. You know, it's not copying the text out of your article. It's it's sort of talking about your article. So they. They didn't, uh, the good newsletter has not done anything wrong to take away from somebody else's hard work. And the good newsletter uh, uh, authors, they work really hard because they read, you know, so many things. So they're out there you know, clicking all these articles, reading all these articles and sifting through them and so forth. Um, so in a way, it's like they're providing a service and their service is kind of a, a gateway to these very good articles that they have selected, right? Um, so I think if they selected your article, you're lucky. Because they brought you new audience that maybe you didn't have any other way. Um, now, I think there was more to your question. Uh oh, what was the second part? Um, is it has anything to do with the journalism ethic, or is it okay? Oh yeah, it's. I think okay. So I think there probably are bad newsletters. 
I haven't read one, but you know, they can't all be great. Right. Um, so there could be an ethics question about a bad newsletter that didn't really do it the way I just described. I described a good newsletter that's very ethical, but maybe there's some other newsletter that's like copying the first two paragraphs of your story and just pasting it into their newsletter. Maybe they're taking your photographs, right? They're doing stuff they actually are stealing from you. That would be unethical. That would be bad. And probably there are some newsletters out there that are trying to do that. Um, but maybe maybe they can't get an audience because that's not really a very, that's not adding value, right? And if they don't add value, I don't think they can keep an audience, right? So I think, yes, it, there could be ethical questions, but I, I think maybe the ones that are unethical, they will fail. Okay, thank you, Professor Mindy. Yeah, please answer everything. Okay. Right. Well, we could go on and on and dissect this topic, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, oh, Mindy, cool. Mindy, I would <laughs> like to thank you for not falling asleep. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you for okay. uh, not only uh, presenting uh, uh, this topic, but also sharing your uh, material with our students. I'm sure that they will be interested in rereading it and uh, okay. we will uh, give the assignment to them as well. And, and, and right. it will be due next week as well. So uh, right. again, thank you uh, for joining us today, Mindy. Uh, thank, okay. I'd like to thank our, uh, I think it's only appropriate if we end this uh, class with final remarks for Padadang. I hope Padadang is still in the room. He is, I see him. He is. He's, he's yeah. shifting I'm on still. his foot. Yeah, I'm still in room, but actually, I can. Oh, yeah, he's, it's he's more. not available. Thank you. Yeah, Professor yeah, Mindy. Uh, <laughs> see you okay, next week. Disturbed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, hey, sorry. Right. sorry. All right, then. Okay. <laughs> oh, look at him. Nikita, <laughs> you're kind of talking over him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is the immigration situation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mindy. See you next week, okay? <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you all of you for your attention. I'm going to go to sleep now. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, get some good rest. Uh, see you again yes. next week. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Mindy. Say hello bye. for Elsa. Bye. Say hello to who? Elsa, he's oh. Ilsa, Ilsa, cats. <laughs> oh, Ilsa, you know, she's 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, so she's very old, but she's still healthy. Yeah, <laughs> she's sleeping in the other room, or I would I would show her. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right, how's go your gators. little girl? Sandy, how's your little girl? Ah, uh, in the school. Ah, uh, okay, good, good, good. She's very cute. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.